Hello. Welcome to uh, what is our third lecture on the cognitive neuroscience of memory as part of this whole cognitive neuroscience online course. Um, in this particular lecture, I'm going to focus on memory deficits. Uh, the first portion will be on amnesia, and then uh, uh, the second portion will be on dementias. And uh, throughout the rest of our discussions of uh, memory, these are going to be very important to our discussions of you know, how we think about, conceptualize, and study memory. And of course, these are also important societal issues. Uh, as we'll talk here in a moment, my mother has advanced Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so this is a personal topic as well. So let's uh, dive right in. We'll start with amnesia, and then we'll get into dementias. So first thing I want to talk about is the extent of memory deficits in typical amnesia patients. Now, the first thing to understand about amnesia is one amnesia is not exactly like another. But some general trends. We tend to get um, global explicit memory loss. So essentially, when we're talking about amnesia, we're usually talking about loss of explicit or declarative forms of memory. Um, there is a couple of really good videos uh, on YouTube and other places about uh, a man named Clive Waring. And Clive Waring uh, has a really unusual case of amnesia in that he has um, really no memory aside from about the last 30 seconds. Uh, he's got nothing else. No previous memory, so complete and total retrograde amnesia. Um, he has some autobiographical memory. Uh, he certainly recognizes his wife, uh, but he has no memories um, of the last... Um, 20 or so, 30 or so years since his <clears throat> case of viral encephalitis caused him to have uh, amnesia. Uh, so we tend to see from a cognitive perspective deficits in free recall, cube recall, and recognition memory. These are specific types of memory tasks that require us to um, remember a specific time or place. Uh, and this goes across all modalities, visual, auditory, sensory, animal, vegetable, mineral. <clears throat> they tend to have spared working memory. Um, Clive Waring, his working memory is pretty limited as well, uh, pretty unusual, but in general, spared working memory. There are, of course, lots of individuals who have difficulties with working memory, and in particular, traumatic brain injury patients tend to have uh, difficulties with working memory. And we'll be getting into that more in, in more detail. Um, we do see some spared, uh, generally spared skill learning, as we saw in uh, the first lecture in this series about uh, Henry Mollison, he was able to learn new skills. Clive Waring, <coughs> uh, the case I was just discussing, um, was a conductor for the BBC, and uh, remarkably, he can still play the piano, although he has no memory of ever having done so. So pretty remarkable cases uh, we generally are talking about. We also interestingly see a generally spared implicit memory. Um, that is, their uh, experiences are encoded and stored in ways in which we don't have conscious access or these patients don't have conscious access. So uh, Graf Squire and Mandler, uh, classic study with some amnesia patients testing against or what we call normal, quote unquote, normal controls. Um, and so here you can see uh, the amnesic patients are in the white bars, um, the control patients in, or control individuals, in the black bars. And you can see um, Pretty significant deficits in free recall. This is where we ask people to just remember anything that might have been presented on a study list. Cued recall, they're given uh, word pairs, and then they're given the first word and asked to recall the second word. You can see pretty significant improvement there. But again, pretty significant reduction in uh, amnesic patients. But interestingly, when we use um, tasks that does not require conscious awareness, um, like a word stem completion task. Uh, and this type of task uh, is one in which we just ask the individual to complete uh, the word stem with the first word that comes to mind. And this kind of task uh, is not asking them to consciously access any experiences. What we can see in the amnesic patient is they're more likely to complete that word stem with a word from the study list than is uh, are the control patients. And so they certainly have memories of those words that were presented, um, but uh, it's how they're accessing that, that's really important. Okay, so then from there, uh, I want to give you a quick introduction to some memory systems and how we talk about these. We're going to be diving in and out of these issues uh, throughout uh, the next several lectures. So a nice overview here uh, to get you thinking about this. First, we have long-term memories versus shorter-term memories. We'll be talking about shorter-term memory uh, coming up 
It might be the next lecture. I'd have to look at um, the sequence. Um, so we're talking about sensory memory, short-term memory, and working memory. Um, here we're generally talking about longer-term memory with amnesia patients and usually declarative memory or explicit memories. Now, interestingly, there is some distinction in those declarative type of, types of memories where we have events or episodic memories. And episodic memories require uh, memory for specific times and places. Whereas our semantic memory is our knowledge, our facts, etc. And what's interesting about these two is they are tied in with one another. That is when you first learn a fact, it's actually tied to a specific time and place. Eventually, those facts become what, what I refer to as hippocampally independent or um, basically independent of any context or awareness. And so the models of memory we're gonna talk about, talk about these memories, facts being entirely stored in cortex don't require the hippocampus at all. Whereas our event memory, memory for what you had for breakfast, what you did yesterday, um, <clears throat> those require the hippocampus. And so um, to give you a good example of the distinction, uh, you know, most American students would, of course, know the first president of the United States is George Washington. And at some point, you remembered the time and place where you learned that fact. You learned it at school or your parents or however. But none of you today um, would be able to tell me where or when you might have learned that fact. It is independent of its time and place. Um, and that's actually the goal of education is to get people to have knowledge that isn't tied to this classroom or that YouTube video or, you know, times, places, etc. So those are declarative memories. We have all sorts of non-declarative memories. And uh, I dove into this a little bit in the motor learning lecture a few lectures back um, where we have procedural memories, which are sort of skills, um, which can be both motor and cognitive, playing the piano, playing tennis, golf, etc. We have a perceptual representation system. We'll kind of skim around this a little bit, but essentially... Um, we have a very shorter term, not conscious form of memory, which holds on to some of our perceptual experiences. And then we have classical conditioning and non-associative learning, which thing, includes things like habituation and sensitization. <clears throat> so episodic memory, as I said, is memory for war events and experiences linked to specific contexts, times and places. Semantic memory, world knowledge that is independent of the specific learning context. And then our implicit memories include things like motor learning and perceptual learning. We'll be visiting these in a number of uh, areas along the way. So let's get into amnesia. So what first thing we want to think about is what causes amnesia, or what we call the etiology of amnesia. And the first of these is what we might call organic amnesia. And this is amnesia that's caused by some sort of natural process. Um, this might be a tumor, could be a stroke, or an aneurysm, or some form of disease. And so here we have an individual with a brain tumor, um, right there in those medial temporal lobe structures, probably causing uh, some memory difficulties. We can, of course, have memory loss due to stroke or other vascular disease. So um, uh, an aneurysm uh, can cause that as well as a stroke. But also we can also we can see uh, neurocognitive functions lost due to disease. So for example, Clive Wernus had a case of viral encephalitis um, caused by the herpes virus. And as a result, um, had pretty significant loss uh, of memory, in fact, almost entire loss of memory. Uh, other diseases um, can cause these kinds of dementias, including, um, like, as I said, herpes, HIV can cause some neurocognitive decline, um, as uh, can syphilis. And so other various diseases can cause memory difficulties. We're currently in the middle of, of course, the coronavirus COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, we'll probably have to wait and see if some individuals emerge from this with neurocognitive difficulties. We do know there are some um, vascular problems associated with this particular disease, so it's possible that there could be some cerebral uh, effects as well. Other types of uh, brain injury that can cause um, amnesia include hypoxia, anoxia, or toxicity. So hypoxia is reductions in oxygen, anoxia is complete lack of oxygen. Um, and then there are other sort of toxic substances that can be associated with um, damage to the hippocampus and the brain structures involved in memory. As we spoke in the previous lecture, um, reductions in uh, oxygen levels can cause significant damage. So drowning um, individuals who um, have had carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, which gets into that toxicity, it's a lack of oxygen plus the toxicity of carbon monoxide. Uh, other uh, potential toxins 
can include heavy metal poisoning, um, pesticide exposure. There's all sorts of potential ways in which we might see um, loss of memory functioning. Uh, penetrating injury, another uh, potential cause of amnesia. Not as common, but as I said, there are individuals who have um, accidents that can sever, say, the diencephalic midline and cause damage. Um, there are other types of penetrating injuries where we might get a survival, but also loss of memory. Far more common is closed head trauma or traumatic brain injury. Uh, this can cause a variety of different types of uh, memory loss. We're going to talk here in just a moment about uh, the time course around this kind of head injury. So if you had a significant car accident um, or a sports injury or a traumatic brain injury in a combat situation, oftentimes we can see um, memory loss sort of surrounding the injury and that tells us a lot about memory. Uh, again, this is a very common type of head trauma. I actually had a mild head injury a couple weeks back. Um, where my head didn't hit something, I actually had a 24-inch pillar candle fall off of a shelf and hit me on the head. Um, <clears throat> but um, that kind of injury can actually have lasting effects. It's just taking me a few weeks to actually get my concentration ability back, and even then it's, it's a little kind of hit or mess. Um, there are other um, ways in which we can uh, see amnesia-induced. So this patient is undergoing electroconvulsive therapy. Um, in which, which is a uh, treatment for depression. Uh, not used all that often. There are uh, certainly patients who still undergo this procedure. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Carrie Fisher, uh, she uh, underwent uh, electroconvulsive therapy um, numerous times to treat her very significant depression. Uh, if you have not read her autobiographies, I highly recommend them. They're really very entertaining, very interesting. The first one is Wishful Drinking. I think the second one is Shockaholic, um, where she talks about her substance abuse and then also how electroconvulsive therapy helped treat her um, depression but and her bipolar disorder. But um, what happens with ECT is we do get um, some injuries surrounding that procedure. And what's unusual about ECT is it's essentially a scheduled head injury. Um, so we can actually quantify memory loss. And so this is a... Um, Slide that's adopted from, or adapted, sorry, from uh, Larry Squire and uh, one of his colleagues um, and memory dysfunction, um, in which we see uh, we get a loss of about six months prior to and about two months after treatment with ECT. So that loss of memory prior to the injury is what we call retrograde amnesia. And loss of memory fall, uh, following the injury is what we call anterograde amnesia. So it moves forward um, and reduces that memory. One of the things that this tells us is that those memories that occurred prior to the injury were not permanently stored, and there's a biological process that's ongoing that um, gets those uh, memories stored. We're going to talk about shrinking retrograde amnesia here in just a minute. So that's ECT. Uh, final uh, kind of um, amnesia that I've actually uh, been involved with is what we call pharmacological amnesia. So the drug midazolam, or Versed, um, is a benzodiazepine sedative that's used um, in a variety of clinical settings, uh, primarily for its mnemonic effects. It's, uh, I mean, it's anxiolytic, that is, it relieves anxiety. And so when you're going into surgery, this is usually the first thing they're gonna give you. So as soon as the anesthesiologist comes in and gets that IV hooked up, they're probably gonna dose you with this pretty solid. Uh, and the reason for that is to get you to relax, keep you from being anxious and tachycardic and you know, potentially having health effects because of anxiety about the surgery. The other thing it does is it actually makes it so that you don't remember what happens during the surgery should you wake up, or sometimes you have to be awake for what are called conscious sedation procedures, um, things like an endoscopy oftentimes you have to be awake for, and so they just load you up with this. Um, in our studies, we gave a fairly low dose, and we're able to actually test healthy patients uh, and compare themselves, their performance when they received a saline placebo to when they received an injection of midazolam. And so we're actually able to really tightly study um, amnesic effects and sort of use this as a model of amnesia. And so uh, that work well, I, I conducted with Elliot Hirschman. Uh, he's got some, done some really great work in this area. Um, some other people involved in this area are Miriam Mincer at Johns Hopkins. 
as well as Lynn Reeder at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and Jason Arndt, who's now at uh, Middlebury in Vermont, uh, was involved in a lot of this research as well. And so I'll look into that, some really interesting stuff. And uh, my students, I'll probably assign some uh, readings just for you to take a look at. <clears throat> so that gets us then into the temporal nature of amnesia. So when we talk about anterior grade amnesia, this is a deficit in new learning. Uh, patients are unable to form new memories. Retrograde amnesia is an inability to access memory for events prior to some injury. Uh, and so this is a loss of information before an injury. And most cases of amnesia are associated with what we call temporally graded amnesia. And this provides really important insight into the process and the timing of the process of forming memories. So if we take a look, uh, this is sort of the first part of an individual with a traumatic brain injury. First thing to understand about traumatic brain injuries is the uh, one of the most important um, variables in how bad a head injury is going to be is whether or not you lost consciousness and how long that lo loss of consciousness might have lasted. And so this individual uh, was in a coma for seven weeks. So this is a significant head injury. And uh, at this examination, you can see here on the right, uh, they have complete total anterior grade amnesia. They remember nothing since the injury and they don't remember anything for two years prior. Um, to the injury. It's a pretty gross um, overall disturbance in memory. What we can see is um, if we go out a few more weeks, so uh, we get another examination, we start getting uh, a little bit of memory back, and that retrograde amnesia is shrinking. That is, we now have. Oop, um, Retrograde amnesia of about a year. The four years prior is a little bit patchy. Um, and then we come back again, and we get very good, precise memory of what's happened uh, recently. Their anterior grade amnesia following the injury is about three and a half months, um, which isn't surprising. So, of course, the first seven weeks of that, they're in a coma, and so you wouldn't expect them to remember anything. But the retrograde amnesia is now reduced down to just the two weeks prior. Uh, so what this tells us about um, traumatic brain injury like this is it disturbs both the encoding and retrieval processes for a while. And then what we see is that retrograde amnesia that's never recovered prior to the injury, that uh, is probably memories that were never consolidated or permanently stored. And so we, we have a, a, a good idea about the timeline for memory consolidation, usually being about two weeks or so. And then of course, because the brain is still recovering in those three and a half months following, uh, none of those memories were ever encoded. And so those memories are gone forever. So that gets us to dementia. This is my mom. Um, I took care of her. I was her sole care provider for five years. Um, so I have a lot of experience with dementias, and so we're going to talk about dementia now. Um, she has dementia of the Alzheimer's type, we're pretty sure. Really, can't really know um, for sure. Uh, she's in a, an, a nursing home. Uh, finally, in 2019, um, her care had gone way beyond my capacity. Uh, and so she went into a skilled nursing facility um, and is very well cared for, um, and so uh, is doing well. This is her from Mother's Day in 2020. Um, this is a very difficult disease to, to live with from a care provider perspective. Um, it certainly can exhaust your resources, um, and this is something that we're going to be facing a lot of. Um, so to give you an idea about memory care and how this might work, um, Medicare does not cover um, inpatient memory care. Uh, you get a couple weeks of nursing home care under Medicare. Um, so if you, uh, don't have some sort of private insurance or are a Medicaid patient, you can't get, uh, inpatient care. Uh, my mom, one of the reasons why, uh, I moved back to Colorado was to get her on to Medicaid because she qualified for Medicaid in Colorado, but she did not in Virginia. And so this is where things get really patchy about our nation's health care. Uh, I don't want to dive too far into that, but the only way I could get her, uh, the care that she needed was to get her on to Medicaid. And so we did that, uh, and she's doing well. And so um, I just want to 
let you know that that a lot of us are f of a certain age are facing this. People who are younger will face this eventually, um, and there are a lot of things to think about. So that's a quick introduction to the, my story, but let's talk about dementia. Dementia refers to a class of disorders in which individuals experience deterioration in memory, thinking, behavior, and the ability to perform everyday activities that are not attributable to normal aging. So um, one of the things about aging is uh, our episodic memories are going to start to decline. <laughs> um, working memory generally intact, we'll start losing some working memory as we get older. Um, most other things are pretty sharp. For example, your semantic memory just tends to get better and better, which is why older adults are so good at Scrabble. Um, to give you an idea of the scope of this problem, about 50 million people worldwide suffer from dementia. The most common forms are Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and what we call mixed dementia, which is a combination of both Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Uh, both appear to have really similar uh, etiology and risk factors. You know, we're still, um, despite decades of research in this area, trying to figure out the exact cause and the exact risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia are difficult. We do know uh, risk factors include lifestyle, um, social isolation, um, diet, exercise, so um, Mediterranean diet, uh, high in omega-3 fish oils, and actually nuts, tree nuts are particularly important, walnuts, that sort of thing. Um, seem to be protective exercise very important staying active staying fit but also having a high quality interactive social life people around you um, etc are very important uh, alzheimer's disease is uh, more closely associated with the epsilon 4 subtype of what's called the apoe4 gene or the apolipoprotein um, epsilon subtype 4 gene uh, but we really don't know the entire cause of that. Uh, the APOE gene is also associated with other um, commonalities with Alzheimer's disease, including increased cholesterol. Um, one of the things we have to understand about Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease is their effects on cognition are uh, fairly distinguishable, as is their neuropathology. Uh, there are ways in which to definitively, definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease now. It used to be um, you could only establish that post-mortem. Uh, one of the issues with that is there's really no reason at this stage to do those kind of differential diagnoses. So you can do a spinal tap, which is a risky procedure, or you can do a PET scan. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, but because you don't treat Alzheimer's disease any different from vascular dementia in terms of the treatment profile, there's no reason to do those scans. So there's no reason to pay for them. There's no reason to uh, increase risk factors um, until we can differentially treat Alzheimer's disease in vascular dementia. There's just no reason to do that kind of test. So it gets us to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is most often characterized by the presence of beta, beta amyloid plaques and tau proteins. Uh, which generally affect the temporal and frontal temporal regions of the brain. There's a lot of chicken and egg problems with uh, beta amyloid plaque and tau proteins. Uh, the focus for a long time has been on that amyloid plaque, um, but animal models have shown that you, if you clear the amyloid plaque, you don't tend to get improvements in cognitive functioning. So it might be causing longer-term permanent damage, which isn't recovered. So the focus right now is on the tau proteins. Um, so, uh, what we see generally are memory and language disruptions. Uh, word finding um, is a common problem, and so um, we start to see um, different types of aphasia. Uh, we also see visual object agnosia and topographic agnosia. Um, sort of one of the earliest um, sort of risk factors or identifiable symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is getting lost in familiar places. Um, so these tend to be pretty prevalent in Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on the sort of personal problem of that patients no longer recognize you. Um, and uh, for me personally, um, my mom over the last couple of years or so would sometimes recognize me and sometimes not. Um, sometimes she thought I was her ex-husband which is weird and creepy. Um, but also I do want to mention that one of the things that Alzheimer's patients do is they do what's called sundowning. 
Um, that is, they do pretty well earlier in the day, and we know most older adults do earlier, pretty well earlier in the day. But as the day goes on, uh, things can go south pretty fast. Um, and so one of the things that my mom would do is uh, she would suddenly not know where she was. And so she would want to go home. And so she would start packing up everything in our apartment, uh, take all of her clothes out of her closet, take everything out of her dressers, um, take pictures off the walls. She actually had everything out of the kitchen cabinets one day um, because of that, just suddenly not knowing where they are. Uh, interestingly, one of the things you can do is actually take the patient outside and come back in. And for some reason, they suddenly know where they are. Um, it's a really difficult uh, disease to deal with. As I said, PET scans can be used to determine the presence of beta amyloid plaques. Really no reason to. Um, it's an expensive procedure. It exposes the patient to radiation. Um, you got to get them to sit still. There's just, there is absolutely no reason to do it because really right now, the only treatments um, for both vascular dementia and um, Alzheimer's disease is uh, a drug called Aricept. It works for a bit, or it might not work at all, um, depending on the patient, um, but it's eventually going to stop working, and you give that drug to either type of patient. There is a, a more rare form of a dementia called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, interestingly, if you give them, uh, it's very easy to diagnose because if you give them Aricept, they suddenly get worse. Um, <clears throat> uh, and once they're off it, they kind of return. Uh, but uh, that's less common. All right, that gets us to vascular dementia. Uh, patients may show some signs of cerebral vascular disease, which appears to affect the prefrontal areas. Uh, executive functions such as attention, planning, speed of mental processing are more often disrupted in vascular dementia patients. Um, I do know, um, personally know a vascular dementia patient, and the testing really made it very clear that that uh, speed of processing was difficult. Uh, with these type of patients, one of the first things that has to happen is they probably need to lose their car keys uh, because that reduction in speed of processing means that they are pretty significant risk for a car accident. Uh, both, types of, of, uh, both types of dementia are associated with steadily worsening cognitive abilities, um, and so the prognosis uh, for both is uh, fairly grim. Uh, ultimately, patients diagnosed with vascular dementia have a mean survival time of about three to five years. Uh, whereas an Alzheimer's patient can live from three to 10 years following diagnosis. So um, pretty rapid decline. These are both uh, terminal illnesses, and I think it's important for families to uh, grapple with that issue. Okay, well, that is uh, an introduction to a memory disease, or sorry, memory, dementias, uh, as well as amnesia. In uh, the next lecture, we're going to get into shorter-term memory systems and their biological underpinnings.